Me, literally a couple of days ago. I'm stuck on the same book for weeks because my attention span deteriorated thanks to that Spawn of the Devil app. Welcome to my TikTok reaction video. <laughs> To be fair though, I'm really having a hard time with this app. It's like a true love-hate relationship because I like the content, like I appreciate the content, it makes me laugh and I like creating the content but at the same time it's taking over my life and I'm not even kidding. If my phone stats are correct, I spent an average seven hours on this damn app like two weeks ago before I deleted it again. Why am I doing this video right after I decided to break this addiction? I legit don't know. Anyway, um, today we're going to watch uh, fashion history TikToks. A lot of you guys are sending me videos of people getting dressed in historical eras or like trying historical makeup and they're like, review. Honestly, I feel like dissing individual creators for dressing inaccurately ain't it for me. Uh, and there is also a power imbalance, like I have a bigger YouTube channel and lots of people watching it and they're mostly just small creators posting videos of themselves doing fun things, so I'm not going to do that. But we're going to focus on those like educational or informational videos and see if they uh, deliver. But before we jump into it, just a quick reminder that it still is not an invitation for you guys to go and bash the creators whose work I'll be presenting and analyzing here. In fact, if you want to give them a follow, give them a follow. If you just want to complain or moan that they're not historically accurate or that they're wrong, maybe just let's not do that. Let's just stick to the video. I cannot frame myself properly because I keep moving. The background is ugly though, but so is the foreground. <laughs> just kidding. Anyway. Hoop skirts! Annoying men since 1846. You see, back then, just like today, men had this nasty habit of putting their hands where they didn't belong. And women got so fed up with it, they started wearing clothes so large that the men physically had to stay away. Isn't that brilliant? Not only that, but because hoop skirts were relatively cheap to make, for once, women of different social classes could all look fabulous and not be picked out in public as poor versus rich and be treated differently because of that. And of course, because women didn't have to wear massive layers of skirts underneath to keep their dresses all poofy, they could actually move for once. So yeah, hoop skirts, an unexpected feminist icon. Okay, um, I agree with the second half. Like it was definitely something that allowed poorer women to for once look fashionable. I'm pretty sure if you were a Victorian woman, you would still be able to tell like who is poor and who is not poor based on the outer garments because the hoop skirt itself wasn't like the only fashion item that you needed to own. Obviously you needed everything, the best quality fabrics and I'm pretty sure that the less well-off women did not really afford that but in general yeah like it was definitely something that was kind of like affordable like you can you can see photos of those like street sellers selling crinolines and even the used ones they could still give you the right silhouette which you know made things a lot easier because if you were working um, I'm guessing like eight petticoats were not your jam <laughs> but there are several problems with that particular TikTok and I I just feel like the the first part with like the sexual harassment and things is like something we want to believe is true because it sounds so cool but and, and empowering and I admit I personally don't believe that every social media post should come with a full bibliography and in fact I rarely list sources in my videos but that comes from mostly the fact that you know it's hard to list sources of your knowledge that you accumulated over the years of being interested in a topic like I don't know what to link to prove that 1880 skirts were asymmetrical most of the time it's just something that I learned because I've been looking at the fashion plates for so long but if you present a piece of information that is sort of controversial or like groundbreaking, you usually want to back it up. So I'm a little bit confused by the date, like why 1846? Was it a year where men were particularly harassing women? I don't think so. Was it a year a crinoline was invented? Not really. Crinolines as in spring steel cage skirts, they were patented in 1850s, but they existed before that in various forms. They didn't come out of nowhere. Like everything in fashion history, it was a gradual process. So throughout 1820s to 1840s and during 
during 1850s. Women's skirts were like gradually getting bigger and bigger and fluffier and gaining volume. And this was achieved mostly by wearing multiple petticoats, some of which were stiffened with things like horse hair or cord. You can imagine these things started getting really heavy at some point. Like there was a lot of layers, it must have been also hot, and people started thinking of like smart alternatives. It was mostly just comfort. It is possible that women did feel safer wearing those, but prinolins weren't those like huge stiff structures that you would just like roll around in. An average 1860s crinoline was like around 35 inches or 89 centimeters in diameter, so that's not that big. And it was flexible, not to mention it swayed. Like if someone walked up to you really close, it would just sway back. I think it would be fantastic if there was a single garment that could prevent men, men from harassing women, but as we know, clothes don't really matter. So I'm sorry to say, like as much as we all want it to be true, I don't think it is. Do you ever look at paintings and think, oh my god, how bad did they smell? You're a Tudor living in the bustling city of London, and because of a lack of understanding about how bacteria and how it works, you're allowed to dump your human and animal waste into any old lake or river. And of course, the largest river by you is the Thames. This turned the Thames into a literal cesspool. We're talking like cholera city. In turn, this has led an entire group of people to believe that water spreads bacteria. And I'll give them this, if you're bathing in cholera-infested lakes, then yes, it will. So to prevent the catching of such disgusting diseases, Tudors didn't bathe in water, like ever. Instead, they rubbed down their body with linen cloths. And if you were wealthy, it changed your chemise every day. No one would ever go without a chemise, ever. I am not an authority on Tudor fashion, but if something sounds really scandalous and controversial, it's probably... it could be a myth. I'm a bit confused because I know about the custom of lining your bathtub with linen, so maybe that's where that comes from, because I genuinely do believe they bathe themselves. According to the website on the Tudor Trail, which is hosted by a researcher. In order to have a bath, most tutors would have had to find a wooden tub, line it with sheets, collect buckets of water, heat the water by the fireplace and fill the tub. It's probably safe to assume that this complicated process probably dissuaded people from bathing daily. There was though nothing stopping them from washing daily. The distinction being that bathing required a person to immerse themselves in a bathtub and washing was more like a sponge bath. So it's kind of like a shower, isn't it? Like, unless you immerse yourself in water, can you actually say that you bathe? I mean, we do have descriptions of like literal bathrooms from the Tudor era, so what would they do in those, if not bathe? But it is true though that they wore chemises, chemises every day, or like shifts, really. I mean, probably from a modern viewpoint, a lot of hygiene customs are were really outdated and really dangerous, but you know, I'm not sure about this one though. Marie Antoinette's disturbing beauty routine. She's famous for this face wash, which consisted of flowers, cucumbers, lemons, crumbs of French rolls, white wine, and the secret ingredient, pigeons, which were stewed and fermented for 17 days. For her foundation, she would have used a highly toxic white chalk made with lead and finished it with a sanded powder. Rouge and lipstick was made from red mercury and was also applied to the earlobes. Since smallpox left many people with dark spots or scars, fake beauty marks made of silk or velvet were very common. Finally, Marie surrounded herself with perfume and pleasant scents to combat the smell of their terrible sewage systems. Um, I don't think so. Like, I mean, some of this, again, I, I don't think a single fashion history TikTok that I've watched so far was like completely wrong. A lot of it is true. Like, yes, they did wear tiny patches. I'm not sure how they're called in English, but in Polish they're called... called to cover skin imperfections and was actually a popular thing to do probably a little bit before Marie Antoinette was hot stuff but again if we read something about hygiene or ridiculous customs in 18th century or you know, in any way in the past. We have to take it with a grain of salt because a lot of it is people in the 19th century inventing things to make themselves feel better. And with Marie Antoinette's pigeon face mask or a cream or whatever, I cannot find a single source confirming this because I got really interested in it because I was like, what was the source of this rumor? And I think the thing that proves that this is actually a rumor is that different sources either list that the pigeons were fermented for 17 days or they say that there were 17 pigeons involved. So I think that shows how this information was misconstrued over the ages. Like it probably started with something like a word written badly on a piece of paper that was read as a pigeon later on. You know, it's so obviously a rumor. <laughs> 
to me at least, I think. But it is true that a lot of formulas at the time did use substances that we consider toxic nowadays. The thing is though, like, if those things seriously affected someone's health and they were still used for like decades or centuries even, wouldn't they notice that something is off? Like wouldn't they be like, damn it, a patch of my skin just peeled off again. I guess it's not my lead based cream. I think it all sounds really exciting and like scary, but when you think about it, those must have been really small amounts to leave them like mostly unaffected. Because if, the, if they were all affected by it, they would probably change the ingredients, right? Like we know that Marie Antoinette did not die because of those cosmetics that she used. Why does it keep closing every single time? Uh, I just noticed that there is 240 million views of the fashion history hashtag. So y'all know that line from All That Jazz where it's like, gonna bruise my knees and roll my stockings down. Well, here's some fun facts about the 1920s. Courtesy of me, your local nerd who is currently doing research because I'm writing a story set in 1928. So with the 1920s flapper silhouette, women were no longer wearing corsets. No corset meant there was nowhere to attach their garters to to hold up their stockings. So it became the fashion to roll your stockings down beneath your knees and put blush on your knees to like, make them look cute, I guess. Women's skirts at the time typically fell below the knee, so they wouldn't really be seen normally, but when they danced, their skirts would flare up. But that's still not all. For some women, rouging their knees with blush wasn't enough. They would paint their knees. What a power move! Ladies, gaties, and ladies, I think it is high time we bring back the paint. Yes, I absolutely agree. Let's bring back painted knees. So this is mostly correct. I mean, apart from the from the part where she says that corsets were not worn in the 1920s and you couldn't attach your stockings anywhere, that was somehow true. Like a lot of people did stop wearing those in the 1920s. They stopped wearing any sort of girdle or corselet and stuff like that. So it was true that it made it difficult to attach your stockings to, to anything because you didn't do it to your pants, obviously. So yeah, stockings that were held by horizontal garters rather than vertical came back to fashion. And it is true that with the shorter skirts, they didn't expose knees, but they were significantly shorter than they used to be. Some knees flashed here and there during a wild night of dances. So it was something new. It was completely new. Like in Western fashion history, this has not happened for like thousands of years. And because of that, People were like, well, I have not seen a knee before in my life and I have not exposed a knee before in my life. Why not make it special? So this sadly was a short-lived trend because in 1930s, the skirts started getting a bit longer again. Again, it probably only applies to like younger generation, the more emancipated women, those that were like partying, those that were independent, not necessarily your like average aristocrat rooting her knees for absolutely no reason, but yeah. Let's bring this shit back. Your favorite whatever says about you. You're going with the safe choice, maybe a bit basic, but you're not wrong. Is this one really your favorite or were you just told it should be? You're either really awesome or you really suck. No middle ground. You are the middle ground. You are a very neutral person. You like the classics. Hey, that's my dad's favorite. Hey, that's my mom's favorite. You pretentious f***er. You piece of shit hipster. You're cool. Like, actually cool. You are what the hipsters think they are. You are a child. And I mean that literally, like, you're not yet a teenager. You are a child. And I mean that as an insult. You are a contrarian. You do not exist. This is no one's favorite. <laughs> This is so good. I need more like costumer memes on TikTok. There is something like, it's so strange because I've met people from like all different sorts of backgrounds and they all had different interests and like almost every costumer has like five different eras that they're their favorite. But there is something special about people obsessed with 18th century. There is just like, it's a different brand of people. I don't know why. Like. They're obsessed. In Bridgerton on Netflix, one of my favorite costuming details is Marina Thompson's lover's eye necklace. It was one of the first things that I noticed about Marina's character, especially because it signals that she has a lover. 
So her necklace was based on a real trend that started in the late 18th century and continued into the 19th century, where essentially you have a miniature painting of your lover's eye, and then that way it can keep their identity a secret. And you can view examples online from museum collections. You'll frequently see them on brooches, sometimes rings, and even pendants. And I find lover's eyes to be so charming. As you can see, I am currently wearing a replica lover's eye brooch. That's so cool, and I actually never noticed that watching Bridget, and probably because there was so much going on with all the characters and costumes. It's such a sweet detail. Like, it really does tell you a lot about the character and also can we please bring these back because this is so cute like there is a lot of Met Gala content under the fashion history TikToks. is it history already if it's 2019 I guess it is and makes me feel very old and irrelevant okay so here is a trend that I wanted to address while we're still at it this one has 61 million views music is copyrighted so I'm just gonna sing something similar uh, you'll bring the corsets yeah uh, we'll bring the cinchers no one wants wants a waste over nine inches uh, uh, uh. no one wants a waste na na <laughs> so this started a whole tiktok trend where you would take a corset and like cinch in it like just tighten it again copyrighted so let me just uh, turn it into a spoken word you bring the corsets we will bring the cinchers no one wants a waist over nine inches Thank you so much. I think my main problem with it is that it's dangerous. <laughs> like as much as I've been talking about corsets not being harmful and like corsets basically being underwear, this shit ain't it, don't do it. First of all, that is not a corset. Let me present it to you. I actually have the same thing because that's the, the cheapest thing you can find on Amazon. Um, This thing, it's not shaped like a corset. It's not boned like a corset, like, this is what the bones do. It's basically, it's not a corset. It's $18, like how good can it be? So the problem with it is that it's not made as a corset. Like if you look at the shape of it, if I close it, there is almost no difference between the top and the bottom. Um, there is no space for the hips there and it's really unhealthy. So my problem is if you wear a corset like this for your outfits, that's all cool. It's probably not going to do anything because it's soft and it's probably not going to hurt you. But if you try to suddenly tighten it, that's where it gets nasty. And I've seen a lot of these trends where people were taking even better made corsets and were just trying to like tighten them as fast as possible. That ain't it. First of all, the corset will be damaged. Second of all, your body will be damaged. And I'm not even going to mention the fact that a lot of these people like the first girl are doing it without chemises on. Anyway, um, <laughs> wait, I'm gonna show you. So this bad boy here is already pr pressing on my hips while it's still loose here. It's because it wasn't made for me and it also doesn't have any hip space. And as a comparison, we have this bad boy, which was made to my measurements and it's not even laced yet. Like it's still open, but you can tell that there is enough space for my hips here. Do I mean that you only can wear made to measure corsets? Absolutely not, but please invest in some good quality ones. There is a whole page dedicated to that. So if you Google uh, Lucy's corset tree, research corset brands, there is a corset shopping guide and it tells you, uh, it shows you a whole map of corset makers and it also gives you a list of corset brands by price range and because it's a person that has actually been involved in the corset re community for like ages she knows what she's saying so she will let you know how to avoid the bad corsets she also has reviewed a lot of these so if you want to invest in a corset just go to that website and like don't go to amazon because this stuff is just fake like i fell for that when i was like 20 because i i googled the cheapest corset possible and this shit showed up and like it's it does not look like it does on a picture it does not have the wasp waist and if it does it's because you tied it too tightly <laughs> why are you so sad kid why are you so sad? that's what the mask is <laughs> that's what the point of the mask is oh this deserves a super like
I like it not only because it's like super nostalgic and makes me want to cry, but also because it shows the variety of waist sizes. Like you can clearly see some ladies with like extremely small waist, which is probably because they had them naturally. Like I personally know a couple of people that naturally possess really small waist. And you know, you don't really get to see that much nowadays because not every type of clothing accentuate those. But if you lived back then, when clothing was literally made to accentuate your waist, that's what it would look like. Like you would just see your friends with the bigger waist, smaller waist. You can see on that video that a lot of women have regularly sized waists. And actually, if you look at the statistics of like average waist sizes, not too bad. It's, it sounds possible, like considering they, they all had a completely different diet as well. By the 1870s, the dress, the bustle was in style, replacing the hoop skirt. Now, why did we go with the bustle, you ask? Think about it. <laughs> She's so funny. I love when museums do TikToks because they usually, like, they're not as cringy as you would think. I love the Uffizi gallery, like, adapting TikTok trends to, like, the stuff they have at the museum. It's hilarious. Here is some copyrighted waltz music. Oh, one, two, three, one, two, three, 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 <laughs> I think the problem with fashion history is that aesthetics often come before interest in actual history. So we discover what we like by the looks of it first, and then we place it in a particular period, and also then we discover the context in which those dresses or outfits were worn. I think it's different when you're just interested in history, because obviously if you're interested in the medieval times, you would also be interested in, you know, not only the wars, I guess, but also what kind of technology they used and what daily lives looked like. Whereas in fashion history, it's kind of like secondary. Like you should be interested in that, but also you don't necessarily absolutely have to know how many times a day they ate, if you know what I mean. Buy it, you don't have to rationalize everything. Hmm. All right, I will buy it. It'll be good for the economy. <laughs> she looks like a million bucks, so it definitely is good for the economy. The only thing I would be wary of is buying things of Amazon may end up badly for you because they might not be what they look like in the pictures. But other than that, you know, she looks great. Oh. <laughs> Why does this make me laugh so much? Okay, whew, okay. So th this time it's playing the Bridgerton version of Viva Vivaldi, so I'll just make a, a flute cover for that. A mood. Hurts. Nearly 3,000 women died in a 10-year period due to their crinoline hoop skirts catching fire. They were also dragged or crushed by passing carriages and machinery. There were Again, if anything sounds really like shocking, it's usually blown out of proportion, but I am willing to believe that it must have been some some sort of way dangerous, especially with like all of the fire that was involved in your daily life. Like, you know, you would spend time in a candlelit room most of the time, and not to mention the fireplaces. So yeah, obviously it must have been dangerous. At the same time, was it that common if women continued to wear hoop skirts, crinolines and wide long skirts? Personally, I have no idea. Maybe it was just a matter of like being really careful. Maybe in a hundred years people will be like, do you know how many women died during the 2020s because their high heels got caught in a rail track? RIP. Old style bonnets are really quite handy. This part covers your face from getting too much sun and this part for the neck. And this puffy part is where you can hide evidence for murders you've committed on the Oregon Trail. I'm not here to judge, you know? <laughs> Obviously 100% historically accurate, that is absolutely what happened. Which is why bonnets were banned in 1894, because too many female murderers could get away with it. <laughs> A healthy reminder! This bitch walked! She f***ing strutted that runway, mama!
so that Peppa could run! Uh, yeah. <laughs> oh my god, okay, uh, this is slowly leaving the uh, fashion history area of interest, so we're gonna stop there. I feel like I have missed half of the good ones. So if you see a fashion history TikTok, don't don't hesitate to tag me and maybe we'll have a part two. Okie doke, that's enough of this awful app for the day. Shout out to all the creators that got picked on today. You're doing an amazing job and don't worry about me criticizing you. It's just, you know, just pointing out things that maybe might have been checked twice. You know, it's not your fault. Actually, if you type in the pigeon Marie Antoinette face mask in Google, there's like countless articles. Oh, I just spat into the camera. There's like countless articles telling you that yes, she did indeed use that as a face wash, except it's like pages like Marie Claire and it's never the scientific sources. So unless you can pinpoint an actual source, like a book that tells you, yes, this is what she wrote in her diary. She was like, yes, I used 17 pigeons. It was great. One of them was unfortunately a bit sick that you should be skeptical of everything you find online because people are lying and it's not your fault that you got bamboozled. But yeah, it's, you know, it happens. Like I've said things in my past videos that are not necessarily true and I've learned that sin. And you know, it's okay if, if things that you said are not correct. Keep doing your stuff. If you want to improve, just do more research and yay for more fashion history TikToks. What? Why the finger? What was I trying? Oh my God. Anyway, bye. Uh, the finger again? Dude, just stop doing that.